Persepolis, the story of a childhood by Marjan Satrapi. Wise, funny, and heartbreaking, Persepolis is Marjan Satrapi's memoir of growing up in Iran during the Islamic Revolution. In powerful black and white comic strip images, Satrapi tells the story of her life in Tehran from ages 6 to 14, years that saw the overthrow of the Shah's regime, the triumph of the Islamic Revolution, and the devastating effects of war with Iraq. The intelligent and outspoken only child of committed Marxists and the great-granddaughter of one of Iran's last emperors, Marjan bears witness to a childhood uniquely entwined with the history of her country. As bombs explode around her and people disappear or are executed, she is still a girl finding her identity, wanting rock posters on her wall and resisting the oppressive regime by listening to punk and trying her first cigarette. And of course, war and totalitarian regimes affect everyone and she rebels against other women who try to curb her freedom of speech and drag her in for questioning or daring to be different. Finally, her parents, knowing that it is just a matter of time that their defiant daughter will get into serious trouble, sends her off to Austria to continue her education. It ends with an emotional goodbye at the airport and she wonders if she will ever see her parents again. Intensely personal, profoundly political and wholly original, Persepolis is at once a story of growing up and a reminder of the human cost of war and political repression. It shows how we carry on with laughter and tears in the face of absurdity. Hello! You are listening to episode 6 of the Literature for Equality Project, a special series by Two Book Nets Talking where we discuss 8 books that deals with gender issues. I am Hani Ahmad. And I'm Diana Yong. This week, we're diving into a memoir in a graphic novel form. Persepolis is Majan Satrapi's memoir of growing up in Iran in a narrative spanning the 70s and early 80s. Persepolis was originally published in French, but is now widely available in many languages and editions around the world. And it's of particular interest to many because of its discussion of women's issues in the Asian context. It's one of my favorite graphic novels. Firstly, because before I've read Persepolis, I've never really read a graphic novel like this. Generally, they are superhero comics or they're very Western narratives. But this one was the first that I think it was in black and white. And it dealt with such heavy issues, but yet still retain a, like a cheekiness and innocence to it because it was told through an eyes of a girl. And secondly, is because I absolutely love Iran. I've been there twice as they were opening up in the early 2000s. And it is an incredible country. It's full of artifacts and history and wonderful carpets, of course, <laughs> contrast. And it has this real line between public and private life. I actually hung out with um, Iranians when I was there. And there is a particular way or how they view life because they have been through so much turmoil and so much political strife and it made me want to know more about its history. So to just give you an idea of what Persepolis means, Persepolis is an incredible archaeological site at the foot of the Kuh-e Rahmat Mountains. It is in southwestern Iran, it's about I think an hour or so out of Shiraz and it's among one of the world's greatest archaeological sites. It really is. I mean, think of Valley of the Kings. This is Iran's Valley of the Kings. This city was begun in 518 BC by Darius the Great. And this is a very, very old civilization. For those of you who don't know when, Darius uh, is actually the father of Xerxes. So if you watch 300, that was the Persian conqueror that they went. Against Darius is his father. I mean, just to, to let you know why she called this novel, uh, this graphic novel Persepolis, right? Because it harkens the glory of Iran in the past, Persian past, and where they are today. I also learned a lot from just reading her book because, you know, she, she goes through a lot of the history and the really long and rich culture that they've had, right? Which I think most people just gloss over. They have no idea. And they also have no idea of the 
you know, the particular kind of history that they had with with being colonized by the by the British, which we would understand because we've been colonized by the British. But it's also ties into why Iran is the way it is now, because it is a response to that 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 period of of their history. He's finally going to pay for what he's done to us. That's right, sweetheart. At last, your father will be avenged. The Shah can pack his bags and join his friends in Washington. I don't know, but I'm, I think I, I like the Shah. He was appointed by God. He was, it's true. God told me that himself. God and the teacher, too. First of all, the Shah was certainly not appointed by God. Yes, he was. The teacher said... That's what they want us to believe. But I'll tell you how it really happened. The truth is... 50 years ago, the Shah's father, who was an officer then, wanted to overthrow the Qajar Emperor to establish a republic. I will be the Iranian Ataturk. I'll modernize this country and I'll create a republic. But the British got wind of his plans and one day... Hello, hello. Are you positive you want to establish a republic? Wouldn't you much rather become emperor? Me? Emperor? Why, of course. Emperor's better than president. And an emperor has absolute power. Anywhere, a great country such as yours needs a strong man, a man like yourself, at its head. Well, that is a good point. Mm. What's more, we both know full well that the clergy is against the Republic. And uh, <laughs> with good reason, I may add. What would I have to do? Nothing. Just give us the oil, and we shall take care of the rest. <laughs> Everything that's yours is now mine. Oh, so he was a total idiot. Oh. Yes and no. Even though he was a dictator, he did modernize Iran. In a way, I guess you could say he loved his country, unlike his son who succeeded him. As of today, I am your new king. I am the light of the Aryan. I will turn this nation into the most modern country of all time, and I will restore the former glory and splendor of our empire. Yes, the Shah's father was brutal. He even put your grandpa in prison, but his son was ten times worse. What? Grandpa was in prison? Well, certainly. He was part of the royal family. He was a Qajar prince. The Shah's father stripped him of all he had. That may be, but he was in prison mainly because he was a communist. <gasps> My grandpa was a Qajar prince and a communist. And I think it's actually quite important to note that Persepolis is not a history of Iran, but it's an Iranian story. So before Satrapi's book came out, most of us didn't know much about Iran beyond the stereotypes and propaganda put out by the Western press. So Majan Satrapi has been quoted as saying, For me, there were so many misunderstandings and so many mistakes concerning my country that I wanted to tell the story in a way that people would understand it better. Persepolis, for her, was a chance to set the record straight about what it was really like to show the world the Iran she knows, you know, beyond the fundamentalism, the fanaticism, and the terrorism that people mostly associate the country with. You know, Margie was raised to be a liberally educated and politically aware citizen. She was very much an idealist, and she believed in equality for all. You know, somebody who describes her family as being very modern and very avant-garde. So, just imagine being someone who was so idealistic and having to conform and be constrained when the Islamic revolution happened. Yeah, I mean, the graphic novel spans the 70s and some parts of the 80s. So can you imagine within like maybe 10 to 15 years, so many things have happened in that country. The Shah was ousted and then they had the Islamic revolution. They had all this sort of like political protests. I always wondered if she chose to tell a story in black and white is because the world that she lived in suddenly became very black and white. Us and them, right and wrong, you know, evil and good. It doesn't seem to be a world that afforded very much gray areas or even color. And I remember Chador's. So when you're reading this book, you see that the women eventually had to wear this very long, I guess the niqab, their version of niqab, which they call Chador's. And they're just kind of like women floating around in black. In fact, it reminds me of the Bene Gesserit <laughs> because we just watched Dune. 
<laughs> but the, the chador itself, and this is what I realized when I was wearing it, when I had to go there, when you go into mausoleums and stuff like that, you actually have to wear a chador, even though you're wearing a headscarf, right? And it is actually just an outer garment that they drape over their clothes. And there's nothing to hold it together. There's no hooks, there's no buttons. You are literally holding it under your chin, which means that, you know, you only have one good hand. And I've seen women wearing it, riding on motorbikes and they had to hold it in their teeth so that it doesn't fly off and I keep and I thought to myself even this garment of modesty is not made for convenience even something small like this makes life difficult for women woman with the shoulder bag please stop running I repeat the woman with the shoulder bag stop running hey you stop where you are Mind telling us why you're running, sister? Because I'm late. I have class in five minutes. But you can't run like that, miss. When you run, your uh, your rear end jiggles. It's what you call immodest. Well, then stop staring at my butt! You know, I think it's just one example of how clothing has always been used to control and constrain women. I think of all throughout history, of all the different ways that we've you have used clothes to constrain women. Like, mm. you know, like just talk about the Chinese and, and the way they bound their feet. That, that was a form of control. Even corsets, hoop skirts, even in the Western dress, you know, there's all these sort of like things that make it very difficult for us to move around. It's just funny you said that because I just remember today reading somewhere where a fashion designer says, I don't believe beauty should be pain. I mean, I don't mm. believe that to look beautiful for a woman, she has to be uncomfortable. I've interrupted you. Carry on, Diana. <laughs> like, you know, corsets were a way of constraining women. Even, they, they were saying that many, for, for many women, every time you have that time of the month, you kind of, you can't even leave the house because there was no way of preventing your clothes from getting all stained and bloodied. And that was a way of, like, controlling women as well because, you know, for that time, that month, that's how they always knew when pe women, you know, like had their periods because, you know, you couldn't leave the house and you just basically had to stay in bed all the time. <laughs> okay, let's come back to Persepolis. You know, a little bit of background on Majan Satrapi. So she was born in Rasht, Iran. So she grew up in a middle or middle to upper middle class family. And she had parents who were both politically active and they supported Marxist causes against the monarchy of the last Shah. When the Islamic revolution took place in 1979, they underwent rule by the Muslim fundamentalist who took power. So during her youth, Satrapi was exposed to the growing brutalities of the various regimes. Many of her family friends were persecuted, arrested, and even murdered. And we can only imagine how the voice of the individual is being silenced when you're going to a regime that polices every single aspect of your life. I think we can only try to imagine what it's really like when you have to go through this kind of, you know, this whole upheaval in your life, like how much that will change your life. Suddenly having the freedoms that you always expected, you know, just being, just being a normal kid at school and suddenly you're, you're, you're constrained, you know, with, uh, girls can't sit with boys, girls can't do certain things, you know, they, they can't interact with boys as much as they used to, they have to always be submissive, they have to be quiet, they have to behave in ways that were considered, you know, like good behavior, suddenly having to do all these things differently, right? You, you can actually see in the comics how Margie clings to her childhood, and she still wants to enjoy all the things that all children do. Yet, you know, time again, the harsh realities of life just keep intruding in her life. Yeah. I mean, she went to a progressive French school. So imagine like somebody that went to international school and suddenly having to uh, constrain all that freedom of speech that she already had from the school. And even as a child, yeah, she was always reprimanded for being very outspoken, for expressing herself. And... When you were talking a little bit just now about the history of Iran, I mean, I guess that is what we were saying, yeah? Because in those days, when you were listening to news, because, you know, there was the Iran-Iraq war as well. So when you were listening to the news of what's going on in that part of the world, it was very, very one-sided. It was just telling you the news. It was just telling you what's going on. 
you don't really know how to feel about them because you're very removed from it. So that is what Persepolis has kind of done. She has found a way to express herself and to tell you her story and give you the human, the human aspect of, of what is it like to live through this. Because they're just people like you and me, trying to survive really, trying to understand how their world has fundamentally changed. Well, you know, that was really my answer to the words, to the word, because, you know, the two times that I left Iran in 84 and in 94, I heard so many crazy things about my, you know, Iran, you know, people, they were saying things and I was like, this is not like this, this is not like that. And, you know, that is a truth, a reality that you see on the TV channel, that I don't say it doesn't exist, it does. But that is many other realities that we never see. So, you know, that was really to say, this I will give you at least another point of view. It's a very personal one. It just engaged my own person, but this is it. And so that was the beginning, how I started it. And of course, you know, I, I wrote it five years after I left Iran the second time. Because, you know, I needed to have distance with the story. I didn't have to be angry anymore. I didn't have to have any violence in me anymore. Because, you know, you cannot answer to the stupidity by stupidity. You cannot answer to the violence by violence. So it's extremely important to take a step back and look at the thing. So that is what I tried to do. And that was the reason I made it in the first place. So one aspect of Persepolis that's very harrowing, I felt, was that you, this is you lose your innocence so quickly, right? Because you suddenly realize even the adults have no control. And it also goes into how women have to now negotiate, you know, the private and public life, how you retain your identity, how you become, you know, the head of your family because men were conscripted into war, and everything is monitored. Clothing was monitored. People can't wear neckties because it was the symbol of the West. Women had to wear the veil. You know, speaking out can get you raped and killed. And having to never see certain family members again. The last time you say goodbye to them might be the last time. This was their reality and it wasn't an easy one. The Iranian people have spoken. The Islamic party has been officially elected with 99.99% .99 of the vote. It's only natural. All revolutions go through a period of transition. Half the country is illiterate. Nationalism or religious fervor are the only things that can bring people together at a time like this. Mina's entire family has left the country. They felt it had become too dangerous. Mosin was found in his bathtub, drowned. Things will work out. It'll be fine. Siamak and his family had to flee the country. The bastards killed his sister. Maybe, maybe we should leave the country. What for? So you can be someone's maid and I can drive a taxi? We must rid this country of all enemies of the revolution. There's only one law between us and them. The law of blood. Margie. What? They arrested Anoush. I know. <laughs> Daddy. That's all right, sweetheart. You want to do something for him? Yes. Anoush has only allowed one visitor, and it's you he wants to see. I'll go. Ten minutes. Despite the circumstances, Majan had the freedom of expression to be herself, and she was not afraid to speak up or rebel when she disagreed with her peers or teachers, which, you know, always <laughs> landed her in trouble, basically. So the Margie in Persepolis had a lot of agency and freedom, and she was never really told that she was too young to understand what was going on around her. Her parents never really forced religion on her. You know, they didn't question her taste in music. She listened to Iron Maiden and she got, she got her par parents to get her like um, posters when they went overseas and stuff like that. And, and they were very good about that. You know, they had no qualms about her dressing in denim jackets and sneakers. And she was very much included when they were talking or discussing with their friends. And she was actually free to voice her own opinions. 
and some of the strips are really harrowing. You know, for instance, her mother puts up masking tape over their windows to prevent shards of glass from flying everywhere in case of bombing. Marjan and her family still defiantly held parties at their home, even though it's been prohibited. And when I was visiting Iran, this was still going on. Like, I got invited to a party and behind closed doors, everybody was relaxed. Everybody did not really wear the veil, you know. And then outside, everybody kind of sort of conformed. And I remember it, there's always a bit of a frisson of fear that you are going to be discovered to be a little bit subversive. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty amazing that Persepolis, you know, you, you, you're reading it and you're, you're actually witnessing all, all these really quite horrific events go on in her life, right? And it's actually really brutal. And she doesn't mince words. Like you, you can tell that, you know, like the experiences that she went through, that was not something that you wanted a young child to experience, but that was the reality of life for them. So, you know, while she dis- she's describing her uncles being tortured, you know, like, like people that they know being cut up into pieces, that kind of thing. Yeah, what, what stands out to me is that she still manages to talk about how proud she was of her country. You know, their the long and really rich history and culture. And, and the way that her family still tries their best to have a very normal life. And kudos to her parents for still allowing her to be, to be a child and to find ways to express herself, which I think is probably one of the hardest things because you're so worried about what's going to happen. You, there's even certain, a certain amount of humor in this, in this story. I think, you know, if you can find that humor wherever you are, that's probably how you survive being under this kind of dictatorship. Yeah. Mm. Throughout history, there have been women who have spoken out against oppression and resisted regimes, right? Uh, Malala Yousafzai, for instance, she spoke out about the Taliban's oppression and the right for girls to attend schools. She was targeted for it. You know, there was an attempted assassination on her life. And she went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014 at the age of 17. And she recently got married. And I remember she, she wrote this article when she said she wasn't really sure about the institution of marriage because there was so much underage marriage. So many girls were forced into marriage. There was so little agency for women in her country that she wasn't sure that this is something for her because what is she upholding, right? Right. But eventually she found somebody who really, who really was, you know, they were equals in that sense. So I thought that was quite lovely, actually. I think she just got married, what, about two weeks ago? Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then you have Nadia Murad, which is a human rights activist who was kidnapped by the Islamic State, ISIS, when she was 19 years old. She and her family are of the Yazidi minority and they were rounded up. And she was held as a slave where she was physically and sexually abused before finally escaping after three months. She founded the Nadia Initiative, an organization dedicated to helping women and children victimized by genocide, mass atrocities, human trafficking, and help them rebuild their lives in communities. If we had an equal to these two really wonderful role models that we have in, in Malala and Nadia, it would probably be Ain Husniza Saifo Nizam. I'm sure all of you listening would would know who I'm talking about because Ain was a was a student who went on TikTok to call out her physical education teacher for a rape joke. Right, he shared in front of the class, and basically the class had been talking about laws that protect minors from sexual abuse and harassment, and the teacher suddenly said, "If you want to rape someone." Make sure they're above 18. Oh my God. So can you imagine being somebody in class and listening to that? And he knows there are girls there because it's, it's almost like rape is so nothing that it's, it's like, you know, it's the only problem is, is it's a legal problem. If you, as long as you don't break the law, it's fine to rape someone. This just happened. So, I mean, you, you kind of feel like, why aren't we beyond this, mm. you know, in this day and age in 2021? I mean, recently there was that actor as well that got called out because on a live talk show, he said jokingly, like he actually enjoyed filming rape scenes. And the entire creative industry rose up and says, you know, rogol bukan jenaka. You know, like rape is not a joke. You should not even joke about it. 
And I don't know whether that's because of the patriarchy or that's just because of, you know, this learned misogyny. We talked about this in Kim Ji Young, how we are actually kind of raised to just accept uh, this is just how life is, you know. I mean, just, you know, people don't really mean it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's so many examples, even in our leadership, right? Mm. Like there, there's, you know, just recently in, in this year, there was that, that minister, female minister who said that, you know, like if you're, if you're at home and, and you want to just to make things easier for the males in the home, speak to them in a nice tone of voice. <laughs> But she didn't exactly say it that way, but you know. Wasn't it like, wasn't it like, act, don't act so clever, act a bit stupid. There was, there was something <laughs> like that, right? If you're clever, yeah. don't show off. <laughs> yeah. Or else you won't get married. Yeah, speak to them in a, in a Doraemon voice so that, you know, like they, they don't feel threatened by you. As if it's only men who have stress. So the women who are who have to stay at home with the men aren't stressed. They have to be nice to the men who are so so delicate, fragile. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that brings us nicely to the end of part one. In part two, we'll talk about our own takeaways and more about women's rights to their own bodies. This is part two of our book discussion on Persepolis. In part one, we talked about how Marjan used the format of graphic novels to give herself a voice in talking about her country's problems. Let's talk a little about women's rights over their own bodies in this part of the discussion. It is our obligation and our duty to behave appropriately. It is from the blood of martyrs that the flowers of our revolution have blossomed. To behave shamelessly is to trample on the blood of all those who sacrifice their lives for our freedom. That is why I ask all the women present here today to refrain from wearing wide leg pants and makeup and to begin wearing longer headscarves that cover their hair entirely. If there are no questions, the meeting is adjourned. Yes? You say that our veils are too short, that our pants are indecent, that we wear makeup, etc., etc. As an art student, most of my time is spent in the workshop. In order to draw, I need to be able to move freely. A longer headscarf would make it all the more difficult. You also criticize us for wearing wide leg pants, even though they hide our curves effectively. But knowing these pants are in style right now, I pose a question. Is religion concerned with protecting our modesty, or is it just opposed to fashion? Your criticism is always directed at women, but what about our brothers? They're allowed to dress as they please. Sometimes they wear clothing so tight you can see their underwear. I just don't understand why, as a woman, you don't think I'd be affected by the sight of men in skin-tight pants, yet you're worried they'll get turned on by a few less inches of veil? Mm. This is a loaded conversation, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's not just society or men that are policing women's bodies, women police themselves. So for instance, in Persepolis, the guardians of the revolution, the women's branch, they stopped Marjan from wearing a denim jacket with a Michael Jackson button on it. Because she, and she was also wearing skinny jeans. And their job was specifically to arrest women who are improperly veiled, meaning that you're showing some strands of hair. And they could detain you for hours or days and you could be whipped. Wow. You know, it's really obvious from the book that Majan was very much influenced by her mother and grandmother, who were both like really very strong and outspoken women. And I read this interview between Majan and Emma Watson, the actress, where she says that her mother grew up in this culture where men and women worked together in the paddy fields. And there was very little division of labor between genders. So her mother raised her to ignore a lot of the prevailing social pressure to treat women as nothing more than baby making machines, you know, where women were only given the chance to use very few of the talents, their brains and abilities. So I think it's quite significant that her mother raised her like this to believe that she could do anything a human being could do. And it really didn't matter whether you were a boy or a girl. So as, as she says, much of the problem in patriarchal culture is because women perpetuate the culture. It's the mothers who tell the daughters to be pretty and to, to be good wife material. And then they, they turn around, they tell the sons, to, you know, that they have all the rights. They have all the, the freedom to do whatever they want. They never control what the sons do. It's the women's magazines who perpetuate this idea that women must look a certain way 
to be considered beautiful. And women have to be the leaders in changing this culture by allowing girls to do non-girly things, you know, like by telling boys not to objectify girls. So that that's the role that all women must must really shoulder because, you know, if we don't start doing this, if we don't start allowing our, our daughters and, and the girls that we know to be just people rather than, you know, like a, a lesser part of society, we're, not, we're never going to change this, are we? Mm. But then you go somewhere like France and you have girls being singled out and persecuted for wanting to wear the veil. So on every aspect of a woman's life, you're constantly policed control, being told what you should or should not do or should should or should not wear, being handled. Like I was watching a show over the weekend and it was basically about this woman who is constantly handled by men, being told that she's gone a bit mad or being told this is what's best for her. So even in the modern context, right, when you think that there's positive discrimination happening for women, Sometimes you do feel a little bit resentful that you think people are saying that, well, you know, we think you should be free, so don't wear the veil. So I don't know, through the years, right? I mean, in history, there has been this constant, I guess, other people telling women what they should be doing with their own bodies and what they should be doing with their own kind of like political voice. So I think it's a really, really hard road that we have to go to break past that, to actually know for yourself whether this is something you want. Because everybody is telling you there's so much noise, right, Diana? Look at how we treat young girls. Like, you know, the way that we, we control how long your school uniform hem should be, you know, like whether or not you're, you're, you're wearing it too tight or whatever. It's just school uniform. Sometimes you don't really control what it looks like, but it's the way people look at you when you're wearing it. And you know, like we often hear about when if you have men coming to the house, you're telling the young girls, oh, no, no, don't, don't wear short shorts when you have men over in the house. It's like you're telling the girls, you know, don't, attract attention but at the same time you're not you're not telling men like don't sexualize girls yeah it goes back to education right like it what does. is it what is it that you're educating your children for yeah mm. i think there was this meme on twitter recently where it was saying like we live in a world where girls and women are fined for trying to cover up while playing sports but also expelled from school if their shoulders are showing so it's kind of like the whole thing at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, right, where there was this Norwegian beach handball team, they were fined because they refused to wear bikini bottoms, which was the standard uniform. Like they wanted to wear shorts instead. And they were fined for doing that. And then, you know, like the German gymnastics team, they also made headlines when they chose to wear full length unitards that covered them from wrist to, to their ankles. And they didn't want to wear like the, the normal like swimsuit style kind of kind of leotard, right? Because because that's like really high cut and that's really quite uncomfortable if, if you think about it. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. You're going to get a Melvin every time you're trying to do a, a vault. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it, and at the same time, girls are blamed if they're sexually harassed or, or if they're assaulted, if they wear like shorts or, or they, if they wear like tight stuff. It's just like women can't get a break, you know, like... I do. <laughs> can't win, can you? <laughs> so interesting. It's the same. I feel for people who are against, uh, who are anti-abortion. I remember when I was in school and I took a women's studies course and my lecturer telling me about how birth control liberated women. And my mind was blown because it never occurred to me until at that point that not being able to control when you fall pregnant has severely crippled women. Imagine having one child after the other, having to look after them without help, especially if you're poor. How can women have careers or plan for a better future for their families? I mean, we have taken a lot of things in our stride today because a lot of stuff is a lot more available, but there are parts of the world where women really have no control over their own bodies. Being able to control when you can have children was literally the one biggest thing that has really liberated women. Did you know, actually, that women aren't even allowed to have a tubal ligation? You know, a procedure to prevent you from having more children. You're not allowed to do that until you have your husband's consent. Even if you've really? had multiple children, yes. 
like in the world, like in Malaysia yes, or in the world? in the world and in Malaysia. <laughs> you're not allowed to do it unless your, your husband signs off on it. What? So you don't have control over your own body in that sense either. Well, you know, I mean, I, I've known people whose husbands have had vasectomies because they've had enough children. And tying your tubes and having a vasectomy is easier to have a vasectomy. Did they ever ever allow women to sign off? <laughs> yeah. husbands? Did they ever ask women if they're ha- happy with that? No. Men can get, get it done. Like They don't even need to, to stay in the hospital. Like It's just an office procedure, right? You just do it and then you can go home. Yeah, but I guess for a guy, right, it's, it does less implications because you don't actually carry a mistake with you <laughs> like a woman does. Oh my god, it's, it's thundering. It's almost like we're talking about all this kind of very kind of deep stuff for women. And then like the, the heavens have opened. Okay, shall we quickly go into our takeaways for this book? One of the things that I thought like, you know, it's, it's quite ironic that it took the publication of this book to really put a human face to the country, to Iran, because, you know, like, Western people were never really able to sympathize with the Iranian experience. You know, like scholars would discuss how the impact of Persepolis, which has helped to correct so many of the assumptions made about Iranian people and to offer this platform to question the Western stereotypes and fears surrounding the Middle East. It's really no coincidence, I really feel, like that when women are included in leadership and governance and allowed to speak up about their lives that this leads to greater stability and peace in a country, which is really, seriously, I think at the end of the day, it just shows that, you know, like when men just discount women and they don't think about women's role in helping to make the world a better place, they just say, oh, the women are, are there just to basically make babies and, you know, like to raise children. And that's all you're really there for. Look at all these countries. For example, Iran's become a very patriarchal country. And all these countries that, you know, like you see time and again, they're the countries that are the most violent, that are the most unstable. And I think there's a lesson there from Malaysia as well. Yeah, I guess I, I love her parents. I think that we are living in a world where gender inequality still happens, but having parents and having a support system that allows you to express yourself gives her also this ability to, I guess, survive and really put out her, her book, I think. So I feel that it is very important to give a safe space for girls to be able to talk and come into their own because not everybody is as privileged as Marjan or us, perhaps. And having a point of view, telling your story, your experiences, this is very important because you never know. Your story can be read by one person that really needed to read it. And I think for Marjan, she has helped a lot of women out there realizing that they can express themselves even in situations where it seemed impossible. So I feel that this is why this graphic novel was widely lauded all over the world, except of course in Iran, where she... (laughs) I'm not sure whether... I don't think she can even return to Iran yet. You know, she still lives in, in France, I think. Marjan, right? You know, like if you want to do something that, that, that really tells people the bold truth, maybe you cannot live in your country for a while. So, in reality, everyone, we have come a long way, but girls do still find it challenging to speak up. For every Ayn out there, there are countless others who find it difficult to voice up to discrimination. What we're saying is that there are many ways to become an activist. You don't just need to, you know, storm buildings or set cars on fire because, you know, you get thrown into jail and that's probably not a good thing, right? But it is also important to note there is more than one way to express yourself. So if you're someone who doesn't feel that you have it in you to stand up on a podium and cry against injustice, there are other ways through writing, through art, to creating more opportunities for other women. This is very important. Creating more opportunities for other women, supporting them, amplifying their voices by sharing their stuff. Sometimes... That's all you need to do. Sometimes you just need to speak up maybe for your friend in class. Me and Diana, we're doing it through a book discussion. So it is not an easy thing to find your voice, but when you do, use it. Mm. Yeah. 
There's this quote that uh, uh, Majan Satrapi said that she said she hopes to inspire women to be able to speak up and to express themselves, you know, because fear and oppression should not control you. Like she says, I've lived through a dictatorship, so I do know what it's like when when you can't control what you do, you can't control what happens to you, but your mind is free. So the only person who stops you from being free is yourself. So you should you should always think of ways in order to educate yourself. And I think she says that even though the regime in in Iran has been has been going on for this for, for this long, she says that actually the percentage of education among the among the genders is actually seventy percent women are students. There are more women students than there are men students, because I think women realize when you take away everything else, you know, they they will do whatever they can to still give themselves the power to to be able to think for themselves, to be able to do things for themselves. You know, that's what's what girls are doing nowadays, right? Girls actually value education more than boys because for us, it means so much more to be educated. So, yeah, do we want to recommend people? Do we have time? We probably don't, but let's do it anyway. Let's do it. Uh, we are discussing Persepolis 1. So there's actually Persepolis 2. And you can buy the graphic novel now together because Persepolis 2 is about her life in Austria and what she experiences when she comes back after living overseas for four years. Yeah, so you kind of see... Her, her as a young adult in Persepolis 2. And it's not as charming as 1 because 1 was still a very much a young girl's point of view. 2, you have that tween and that teenage angst as well. You can also check out Mouse by Art Spiegelman. So Mouse is about the story of Spiegelman's father's escape from the Nazis. It uses animal iconography. So the Jewish characters are mice and the Nazis are cats. So it retells the story of the Holocaust in poignant and devastating clarity. Spiegelman depicts these experiences from the years leading up to World War II to his parents' liberation from the Nazi concentration camps. And this is the first and only graphic novel that has won a Pulitzer Prize thus far. I think that's the thing, right? I feel that graphic novels have really, really managed to discuss and talk about very hard issues because it uses a visual format. And there's some really, really amazing graphic novels out there. And yes, graphic novel is still considered reading, everyone. So you can also pick up Grass by Kyum Suk Gendry Kim. Kyum Suk actually interviewed an old Korean woman named Lee Ok Soon. I am massacring their names. And she interviewed this lady in order to learn about social class and gender disparity during World War II and write a book. But after several interviews, she realizes that Lee's personal story needed a book of his own. So Grass is a story of a Korean woman that is taken hostage during World War II and how she becomes a comfort woman for Japanese soldiers. Since we're on the topic of graphic novels, you can also listen to our season three, episode six, which is an episode on the comic book series titled Lock and Key by Joe Hill and illustrated by Gabriel Rodriguez. The comic series is a story of the Locke siblings, Tyler, Kinsey, and little Bodie, who, along with their mother, return to the ancestral home of Key House following their father's gruesome murder. Now, I don't know that I would consider this to be any less intense. It's not gender-based, but it is quite... How should I say this? Well, horrific? <laughs> horrific? Or is, it, is, it, is it like... It's, it's, it's more... It's it's, it's it's quite... Yeah, it's horror, but I mean, like, you know, like, if you read stuff that... There's a lot of horror stuff out there that kids like anyway. Mm. But, but one thing uh, it does deal with is on grief. So it is a graphic novel that deals with how a family deals with grief. So it has all those layers as well. And the artwork is beautiful. Gabriel Rodriguez draws beautifully. Right, and you can also listen to our Minnesota 14 where we recommend some fun coming of age and family stories in graphic novel style as well. So, now that you've listened to our show on giving every girl a voice, why don't you give your take on this? We want you to express yourself. 
Tell us about a time where your voice was shut down because you're too young, or this isn't a girl's matter. Maybe act it out in a skit or write a short story about it. You can also interview your parents, grandparents, mom, aunt, neighbor, or whether they had the freedom of expression during their younger days. How was it in those days and how is it today? You can contrast it to how it is like for you today. And if you're good at makeup for both boys and girls, show us how you use makeup to express yourself perhaps, or how you dress to express yourself, or dance. You know, there's so many TikTok dances that you can do out there. So be creative. We have a competition open for students aged 12 to 20, and we've actually extended the date to the end of April 2022. So you have plenty of time to think about what kind of entry you want to be putting in. You can keep up to date on our social media for all the information about this contest. And when you post up your entries, don't forget to tag us at Literature for Equality Contest. Yeah, this is the sixth episode of our Literature for Equality project, supported by the Canadian Fund for Local Initiatives. Please check out our other seven episodes and join the conversation on gender equality. We can find all the information about this whole project at our website at rngdr.com LFE. This is a Two Book Nerds Talking special project and you have been listening to me, Diana Yong, and my partner, Hani Ahmad. Thanks for listening, everyone.